Welcome to MadPile's webinar series. For those of you who are not familiar with us, we deliver research-inspired design aimed at improving the experiences people have with technology, organizations, and each other. But enough about us. The webinar, <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Psychophysiology, it's a mouthful, and eye tracking with new and old technologies that complement usability research is the ninth webinar in our monthly series. Today, Dan Berlin, one of our experienced research directors, will be sharing his insights on the subject. A little bit about Dan. Dan performs both traditional and novel user experience research techniques at MadPow. All our client engagements are varied. Dan helps determine which research activities are the most appropriate and will collect the most usable data for a particular project. After seven years of working with hard-to-use interfaces and technical support, Dan found his user experience design calling after participating in a usability study. Dan enrolled in the MBA and MS in Human Factors and Information Design program at Bentley University. After graduating from Bentley, Dan spent two years at an interactive agency performing usability and neuromarketing research studies. For the latter research, Dan investigated eye tracking and biofeedback methodologies and has presented extensively on these topics. Dan is an active member of the Usability Professionals Association, holds a BA in Psychology from Brandeis University, and is particularly interested in visual space perception. A few housekeeping items for today as well. Um, just to let you guys know, there will be 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. We will be live tweeting, and you can use the hashtag MadPow, or you can talk directly to us at MadPow. Um, the slides and video will be available on our website in about two days. Uh, we'll be um, promoting this on Twitter, Facebook, and we'll send an email out to everyone, sending the link so you guys can have it. Um, if there, and just some feedback too, if you have any questions, please put them um, on the chat box. Which you'll see that on the right-hand side. Um, there's also a Q&A box that you can put your questions that you have at the end for Dan and we'll be answering those as they come. Um, also, if, like I said, if you have any questions or any concerns with um, using WebEx, definitely feel free to privately chat um, myself, which is the webinar's um, username. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dan. Thanks again, guys, for coming, and enjoy. Thank you, Courtney, and hello, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to uh, listen in today. And Hopefully you uh, learned something new today. Um, I'll be speaking for about 45 minutes, and then at the end I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Um, and again, as Courtney mentioned, if you have any questions that you'd like discussed, uh, please put them in the, uh, the WebEx chat window, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Uh, so with that, I'll dig right in. Um, if my screen would advance, there we go. So just a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today, or what I'll be talking about today. Um, starting with the history of both eye tracking and psychophysiology, and then moving on to how it's used today with modern met metrics and methodologies. Uh, and, and I'm talking purely in terms of eye tracking for usability for human computer optimization, not as using it for an input device um, as an interface as itself. Uh, I'll go through some of the equipment that's available. Uh, and then we'll start talking about psychophysiology and how neuromarketing, as it is today, needs to evolve to suit the UX community, the user experience community, uh, and then how psychophysiology can be used in, in user experience. Uh, and I may use the term psychophys uh, at some point through the webinar, really referring back to psychophysiology, um, which I'll, I'll def define in a little bit. Um, Courtney already did the introduction, but just a little bit about myself. Um, user experience, research, uh, experience research director at Manpow in the Boston office uh, with a real passion for quantitative data. I'm a sucker for stats and finding out, getting, getting quantitative data out of, um, out of users. Uh, so that's where my passion lies, and that's why I'm giving this webinar today. And what I won't be talking about is also pretty important. Um, I will be talking about the validity of current metrics and methodology. I'll be posing some to you, but whether you know they're, they're accurate or not, I do believe some of these are indeed very accurate, um, and there's a lot of debate in the field on that. Um, won't be talking about that today. We don't have a full day. <laughs> um, and, and then what these two fields have taught us about human behavior in general. Uh, won't be really won't be discussing that as far as what uh, different uh, things actually mean uh, in terms of human behavior itself. 
And we're, we're concentrating the psychophysiological discussion on galvanic skin response or skin conductance, um, heart rate variability, heart rate, breathing rate, neurological signs, and temperature are not in discussion today. These are other physiological traces that um, give us good insight into human, uh, into the mind, uh, but uh, those are out of scope for today. So why, why is this important? Why are you taking an hour out of your day to listen to this? Our, uh, us user experience researchers are always looking to collect new objective data. And we really rely on qualitative methods. That's where the, the field was born out of, of um, questioning users and asking them how they feel about things. Um, but we really have always been searching for a quantitative measure to complement these qualitative measures. Um, and eye tracking has served that quantitative um, need for years. Um, but there's a real opportunity here to marry that up with uh, psychophysiology in order to get some really amazing quantitative data, again, that will complement qualitative. I'm never saying that we should get rid of qualitative methods because they're very valuable, uh, but we should be looking for new ways to complement them. And, uh, and eye, tracking do, uh, eye tracking metrics do provide um, that, that objective data based on the, the behavior. Um, but the metrics that we have available today and the methods that we have available today, we've been using them for years. Um, and it's really only the beginning in terms of what eye tracking um, can do for us. Uh, there's, there's great opportunity there. So pairing physio, uh, psychophysiology with eye tracking really is the next logical step. Uh, we have the ability with new technology to bridge that gap, uh, a lot of this has been very expensive in the past, uh, and, and a lot. And the point of this is to align usability with business goals. And part of business goals is to get discount usability testing. Um, when what I mean by that is doing it as quickly and cheaply as possible. Uh, we want to be able to do the psychophysiological methods in this discount usability testing uh, vein. So digging into eye tracking itself, and we'll, we'll, we'll I'll start with eye tracking, go into some of the history and metrics that are used today, and then we'll turn the conversation over to psychophysiology. So what, what is eye tracking? Uh, and what you're seeing there, uh, the picture is a Toby 1750. Toby is one of the eye tracking vendors. And the 1750 is the most prevalent eye, track, eye tracker that you'll see out there. Uh, it was one of the first ones, and uh, it's one that you'll see in a lot of labs these days. And eye tracking, allows us to record and observe eye movements. As a participant is looking over a website or whatever's on the screen, an application, we can see the order in which they look at the items on the screen and how long they look at the items on the screen. And that's the, the, the objective behavioral data that I mentioned. Uh, it's objective because it's, not, it's, it's the person's behavior. It's not being filtered through a cognitive bias. They're not reporting things back to us. We're actually observing their behavior as opposed to getting qualitative information about their behavior. And some of the terminology that I'll be using today, and that's important for, to know and to, for eye tracking, fixations, saccades, and scan paths. Fixations are when someone stops to look at something for more than 10 milliseconds. Saccade is that path between the fixations. So if you can imagine uh, a, a dot being a fixation, and then the line connecting two dots is that path uh, that, they, that they took. And then the scan path is the set of fixations and saccades uh, in a given amount of time. So what is the pattern there uh, when they were looking at the navigation, for instance? What was their scan path when they were looking uh, through the navigation or looking for something on the page? And Eye tracking as we know it today really began with uh, Goldberg and Kotel, uh, who developed those initial eye tracking metrics for on-screen tasks. Um, it was, eye tracking was born out of um, real-world tasks, not uh, on, a, on a screen. And, and these folks came up with those initial metrics that really brought eye tracking to the user experience world. And we're talking mostly about fixations and saccades and scan paths here today not really talking about pupil dilation, blink rate, or facial recognition, which you may hear uh, people talking about in terms of eye tracking and psychophys. Uh, pupil dilation is very hard to measure um, in a lab setting or in, in general due to ambient lighting, and it's, it's just not worth, worth the effort, especially for, for looking for a discount 
um, method. And I've not, I have not been impressed with any of the facial recognition software that I've played with to date. Um, so those are out of scope for today as well. So eye tracking, the history of eye tracking. Uh, believe it or not, it is more than 100 years old. People have been doing this for a very long time in various ways. That picture you see there with the guy with the, the, the bite bar and the helmet, uh, that, that, that was the, how they did it in the, the 50s and 60s. Um, people reported having neck problems afterwards because the helmet was so heavy. Uh, they used different types of contact lenses with wires coming out, uh, little electrodes placed around the eyes. Um, but became more mainstream in the 1950s with uh, the FAA doing eye tracking studies on pilots in order to improve cockpit design. Uh, and that's where they mounted cameras all, all, all around the cockpit in order to see where the person was looking. Uh, but today, uh, as you can see in the bottom picture there, modern eye tracking equipment is, is not the helmet uh, of yesteryear. Uh, what you're seeing there is one that's based in a monitor. It's what we call a remote uh, eye tracking solution. And in those, they, the, the way they typically work is that infrared light shines out of the monitor and bounces off of uh, the retina, <laughs> and then bounces, which bounces back to the monitor in order to determine where the person is looking. A lot less invasive. And what do you get out of, out of eye tracking? Um, I had to show you the, the, the visualizations because these are what you normally see uh, with eye tracking data. And uh, these are eye candy, honestly. Um, these are what stakeholders like to see. Uh, this is how they get the, what they observe to be the most bang for the buck. Uh, this is the eye candy that shows the eye tracking. Uh, researchers, though, are really looking at the data. They're looking at spreadsheets and graphs and such, or at least they should be. Uh, you can't really do much analysis, per se, from these visualizations. These are nice summaries at the end of the day. But what you're looking at uh, on, the, on the left side is uh, the number of fixations for all of the participants, where red indicates that there were a lot of fixations, yellow, medium number, green, low number, and then gray, none. And this is a nice view of looking at all of your participants to see what was salient on the page. What were they looking at? On the right side, you see a gaze plot. And this is for one single participant. Uh, and as you can see, there's a lot of, um, you know, if we had it for more participants, it would just be a jumble. Uh, so that's why it's best to look at this on a one participant basis. And what you're looking at are the fixations are and saccades and the order of those fixations, which is, all, which is pretty important. These are numbered one, two, three, four, and then they move around from there. And the size of the, uh, the dot indicates the length of the fixation. So for number 14, uh, this person was looking at the Google logo for quite some time, or this image. And these are the two visualizations that you see most uh, from eye tracking. But again, these are really just eye candy for the, the, the final report that the researchers put together. The real data comes in, in spreadsheet form, and it's not as pretty to look at. So how do we go about doing this? Uh, getting into some basic methodology here. First off, the most important thing to do, one of the most important things to do, is to break up your pages or page into areas of interest. We want to look at this as granularly as possible. So take a look at your, uh, so segment out your logo, your navigation item, your content areas, your secondary navigation, that sort of thing. And all of, this, all of the um, standard eye tracking analysis software has this functionality. And what you want to do is break it up so that you get a, a more granular view of your page. You're not looking at the page as a whole. And the whole idea is to compare the fixation data between uh, AOIs. Again, the AOIs are areas of interest, those boxes that you're seeing on the right. And you want to compare the data. That's, that's the, the idea here, whether it's between AOIs. So, so for instance, someone is looking at uh, the navigation more than content or between designs. So in, in design one, someone was looking at something more than in design two, that sort of thing. It's all about having something to compare. Without the comparison, eye tracking data really doesn't tell much of a story. You want to be able to show in, in a marked improvement um, over time if you're doing different designs. You want, to, you want to find opportunities for improvement. So if people are looking at the navigation for a long time and they're having trouble understanding it, perhaps that, that's a, a cause to take a look at your information architecture, um, and comparing it to the different AOI, uh, AOIs or designs. 
And there's no standards for eye tracking metrics. It's not, you can't say that looking at something for 15 milliseconds is a good or a bad thing. There's really no, there's no standard metrics. So what we want to do is rely on those comparisons in order to get interesting, usable, actionable data. So that's the basic methodology. Uh, the basic interpretation really comes down to two things, the number of fixations and the fixation durations. Uh, number of fixations. So where are they looking on the page and for how many times? Are they looking at a call to action? Um, are they, or, or are they finding that important call to action or is, are none of the participants looking at it? Are users reading the content? Is a piece of content falling off the bottom of the page uh, that no one ever gets to? This sort of thing. These are the types of things that number of fixations can tell us. Fixation duration, uh, that's how long they were looking at something. Uh, for instance, were they spending an inordinate amount of time looking at a single link? Uh, were they confused or were they intrigued by that? Uh, are they particularly engaged with one of the design elements? Um, so it, these are the basic ways of inter interpreting the fixation data. Uh, it gets more complex than that, some of which I'll talk about. Uh, but this really gives a baseline for how we evaluate eye tracking data. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, researchers really aren't looking at the, uh, the heat maps and gaze plots to do the analysis. It really comes down to spreadsheets and charts. And this is just some data that I made up. This is not from a real study. Uh, but it does show the idea of comparing two designs. So what you have here are different areas of interest along the bottom, area one, two, three, four. And then two designs in, in red and gray. And what this, this graph would be showing is that in design one, area one um, drew way more attention than in design two. And, in, and then in the design two, uh, area two drew a lot more attention. This, and this is the type of stuff that we can get out of eye tracking. Uh, again, comparing uh, is the way to go. It gives you the best um, trajectory and actionable items. So digging into a little bit more eye tracking methodology um, and a series of, of, of papers that are out there, uh, Ago Boyko uh, showed how a combination of eye tracking and click data showed highlight the differences in search behavior. A uh, great case study um, where the increased time on task uh, and, and what, what, what uh, the study was showing what we were comparing was an old website with a new website. And they wanted to see how the user's search behavior changed between the two. And with a combination of eye tracking and click tracking, the researchers found that the old design had a lot uh, more fixations before the users were doing an on-target click. And what I mean by on-target is that that was essentially the past condition, what they were wanting people to click on. So the old site had a lot more fixations before the, uh, the, than, than the new site, which really indicated that the new site, people had more efficient search behaviors. Additionally, uh, the scan, scan paths in the, uh, the study, and again, scan paths are the um, set of fixations on saccades within a given amount of time or in a given area. Uh, the, the scan paths in that study showed how in the new design, certain targets were more noticeable. That is, they were clicked upon first fixation. One of the uh, metrics that we can get at eye tracking is what's the, when's the first time they looked at it? Or did they come back to it a, um, a second time? Did they not click on it the first time and clicked on it the second time? Which would indicate maybe it wasn't as noticeable or the word for the link wasn't quite working and they had to think about it. So all sorts of great stuff that we can get out of eye tracking that go beyond the qualitative that we normally get out of, out of users. Um, so uh, this interesting study, the idea here was to correlate patterns, eye movement patterns, with usability problems. And that, that, and that is, um, what do these different behavior patterns with eye movement show us about usability problems? And this, they, their paper showed um, uh, some promising patterns, but nothing was really concrete. More research is definitely needed. One of the interesting things that came out of it was that multiple quick fixations may indicate some missing information, where a person is just looking really quick, very short um, saccades. And the idea here, again, was to encapsulate 
the behaviors and see if they indicate particular usability problems. Uh, it's an interesting idea, definitely more research is needed, but you really have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, the, the catchphrase in user experience is it depends. So you always want to take the stimulus into account and does a behavior observed on one website necessarily apply to a different website? Um, that's what this research was trying to get at. Um, it's an interesting idea, but a little bit more research is needed. And very recently, uh, journey, map, journey mapping, which is um, near and dear to our hearts at Manpow, uh, some folks did some journey mapping with a head-mounted eye tracker for real-world tasks and scenarios. They used one of the, uh, the goggles, which I'll show to you in a moment, in order to observe a person's journey uh, for in the real world and interacting with computers. Uh, so it really takes it from on screen to the real world, which is very interesting. And this is this is bleeding edge stuff, um, but something to keep an eye on. So these next two slides, I'm not going to go um, in depth into each of the, the metrics, but what I have here are a list of metrics that you can use when doing eye tracking analysis. Uh, Pool and Ball um, gave a great um, summary of all the eye tracking metrics that are out there. And I've already summarized some of them here. I left some out that really aren't as prevalent. Um, but ones in particular I want to point out are the ones in red here. So this page is dealing with fixations. And the first one is fixations per AOI, per area of interest. So what this means is that an increased number of fixations will indicate increased noticeability or importance. So people are noticing things more if they're fixating on it more or they're more interested in it. Um, and that's the sort of stuff that we can probe on later. Okay, we noticed you were looking at this, this thing for a while. Was that interesting to you? Why? Again, complementing quantitative, uh, qualitative with the quantitative. Uh, overall fixation duration. duration uh, an increased duration typically uh, indicates confusion or engagement. Again, it comes back to they're looking at something for a long time. So either they were confused or they were engaged. And we can typically uh, understand which of the two these are based on the context, um, whether they're, they seem to be searching for something or if they're, they're reading something, or, um, or we can just ask them later, of course. And then finally on this page, the time to first, fix, first, fix, bleh, first fixation on target. Um, again, on target meaning this is the, the area that we were hoping they were going to look at. And a faster time to first fixation uh, indic indicates increased noticeability. So if they're looking at that uh, on-target uh, item quicker, uh, then it, it is noticeable, and that, that's great. We don't want the important thing, the call to action on the page, to be the last thing people look at. We want that to be as findable and noticeable as soon as possible. Moving on to saccades and scan path metrics. Um, just two I'm going to go over here, but the rest you can take a look at in your leisure. Uh, overall number of saccades. So what this means is that person that the person is looking around the page a lot, a lot of saccades, a lot of fixations, most likely, or short success, uh, short fixations. And this is indicating more searching, they're looking all around the page in order to find that which they're looking for. So you want to decrease that number of saccades if uh, you're dealing with a search task. And then finally here, the fixation to saccade ratio. Uh, it's a nice little ratio that indicates searching. Again, it comes back to what I was just saying with the number of saccades. Um, you want more fixation and less saccades. Fixation indicating that they're actually reading or doing something. Saccades indicating that they're searching for something. So a higher, higher ratio here would indicate less searching, more actual processing of information, and that's what we want on the page. Um, again, this is just a smattering of the metrics that are available. Um, a lot more to take a look at. Um, but use these um, as you can. So uh, using uh, eye tracking and a usability study, what do you have to keep in mind, uh, the logistics here? So first off, you need to do within subject study design. Um, and within subjects means that all of the participants see all of the stimuli as opposed to a between subjects uh, study design. And you want to do this because people have different viewing patterns. And you want that, again, you want, to, you want that data to be comparable. That's very important. So if you show one group one stimulus and you show another group another stimulus, that data really isn't comparable because the people in the two groups are going to have different behaviors. Um, so within, sub, within subjects, study design. 
uh, and have them look at the stimulus in the course of performing a task. It's pretty important. Um, it keeps the data relevant and contextual because, they're, they're, again, they're doing a task. They're not just looking around the screen. And people aren't looking at static pages um, when, they're, when they're on uh, a computer. They're typically performing tasks or doing uh, something on the website or doing something on the application. They're not just sitting there looking at the screen. So you want to have them do this in the course of performing a task. Uh, think aloud. In uh, usability studies, we typically use the Think Aloud protocol uh, in order to get, as, get at as much qualitative information as possible. But this may be distracting for the participant. Uh, they, it's human nature to, for uh, someone to look at the person they're talking to, which takes their uh, eyes off of the screen. So it becomes an unnatural situation. Uh, so I would suggest not using Think Aloud while doing eye tracking studies or at least doing while, while doing eye-tracking tasks. Um, some research has uh, been done into retrospective think aloud, or RTA, wherein people um, will, participants will look at their eye movements after the fact and discuss it with the moderator and to say, oh, I was thinking this, that, uh, while looking at that. Um, the jury's still out on that. Um, it goes both ways, whether a ret retrospective think aloud captures more information or not. Um, I believe that it reintroduces cognitive bias. Uh, the, part of the whole idea here is to remove the cognitive bias that's inherent with dealing with participants and when their words are filtered through their mind. We want to eliminate that and get right at the behavior. Eye tracking and psychophys allow that, so by introducing or just making think aloud, you're reintroducing the cognitive bias. But something to keep in mind. Uh, and recruiting. Uh, you want to be careful with your recruiting. First off, you have to over-recruit. Get more participants than you, than you uh, want in the entire study because you're not going to be able to use the data from every participant. That's just the way it goes. So you do have to over-recruit to make sure that you have usable data from all of the participants. And then you do have to screen out participants with either corneal or retinal damage. The, uh, the eye trackers typically work by Again, bouncing that infrared light off of the um, through the cornea and, and, and uh, bouncing it off of the retina. And if uh, that path is messed up in any way, then uh, the light won't be able to work. Um, some of the eye trackers these days do better with um, do okay with just one eye, um, but they typically do need uh, both eyes operational. So you want to screen out for um, various diseases and damage. The, uh, the equipment that's available. Let's talk about this for a moment. The two major players are Toby and SMI, um, both European-based companies. And what you're seeing are the, their remote solutions up top and then the head-mounted solutions on the bottom. Uh, both companies offer all uh, three types of, of solutions. So remote is monitor-based, just like this. Head-mounted have a glasses um, with infrared lights and a scene camera. Scene camera points out so we know what the person's looking at. <laughs> and then the flexible one is this bar here. Um, Toby actually makes one as well. I don't have a picture of it. But the idea is that you can put this anywhere or put it right on your laptop and use your own monitor or laptop. Um, and there are other cheaper options coming out these days, um, some of which I have played with, and, well, you get what you pay for. Um, Toby and SMI have been doing this for a number of years. The newer players haven't. It'll take a while for them to catch up. One second, let's check some more. So I've talked a lot about how to do eye tracking in your studies. Um, and the metrics for the analysis. But um, the first word in this webinar name was psychophysiology, so when am I going to get to that? Just about now. So right now, we do eye use eye tracking metrics. It's, but I think it's just the tip of the iceberg. And we have to take a step back and remember what eye tracking actually does. Let's take a step back to the metrics and analysis. What does eye tracking do? It tells us where people are looking, plain and simple. That's, that's just at its bare form. They tell us where they're looking at a given time. So what other temporal objective data can we use in conjunction with eye tracking? And that's where psychophysiology, psychophysiology comes in. So 
So psychophysiology. It's a long word. What does it mean? So in the late 1800s, again, a long time ago, longer than you would, you would think, Figaro discovered electrodermal activity. And this is, well, EDA, you may hear it referred to. And electrodermal activity will change based on a person's feelings. So electrodermal activity is the skin's electrical conductance or resistance, depending on how you're measuring it. Um, and they will change based on positive or negative arousal or stress. So that means that we can observe a person's psychological reaction without asking them any questions. Again, removing that cognitive bias and observing their, their behavior directly. And galvanic skin response is the typical metric used to measure electrodermal activity. Uh, or you'll see this referred to as GSR. And it measures the conductivity of the skin. And the way this works is that uh, when, you, when, you, when you sweat or when you're stressed or when you're aroused, you sweat. And those sweat glands are controlled by the sympathetic system. And so you sweat when you're aroused, uh, either positively or negatively. And the more you sweat, the more your skin conductivity is. It's actually that simple. And it's a very um, fast um, method of doing this. So it's, just, it's uh, almost as in instantaneous, uh, the reaction. And, and so where does psychophysiology come in? That's the whole process of analyzing the physiological metrics, in this case GSR, in order to determine a person's psychological state. Um, and I'm not saying that we can read people's minds, but we can definitely get better insight into their behaviors and ask more pointed questions uh, when it comes to the qualitative. Um, and as I mentioned at the very beginning, there are other um, biometric traces that we, can, we could look at, uh, but, but these are really beyond the scope of, of where I think user experience needs to go. Uh, I've got related potentials, EEG, heart rate, heart rate variability, blood pressure, EMG, and respiration. And they all do different things. Uh, they measure different areas, either mental workload or um, arousal valence, stress, that sort of thing. Um, but GSR is really the most promising. So some of you may be thinking, hey, wait a second, isn't all of this neuromarketing? Why hasn't he said neuromarketing here? Um, so for those unfamiliar, neuromarketing is a, is a newer field where companies typically use EEG and EMG uh, to, for marketing type studies. And uh, EEG, well, I'll get to that in a moment. So on the, on the, on the left side here um, is functional MRI. And this is where neuromarketing was really born out of. Measured blood oxygenation. And when an area of your brain becomes more oxygenated, it's in use. And we, we, we have a pretty good map of, where, of, the, of the brain areas. So the idea here is, all right, when they're exposed to a certain stimulus, um, what areas of the brain are lighting up, um, lighting up meaning uh, are activated. Uh, were they sad, were they happy, were they scared, et cetera. But it's very expensive, and getting time on an fMRI machine, you have to go to a hospital, or it's going to be uh, possibly stressful for the participant, um, and uh, most importantly, very expensive. So we moved on to neuromarketing, moved on to EEG and EMG. EEG is the measurement of the brain uh, electrical activity, which is measurable on the scalp. So you see the person here wearing the swim cap, and, with, and then she's also got the little um, sensor right under her eye. That's the EMG. Um, measuring uh, muscle in the face. And the idea here is to interpret the EEG signals in order to get different states, excited, re relaxed, um, um, attention, meditation, that sort of thing. But again, very complex. Um, and why am I bringing this up? Neural marketing is really not helping the, the user experience community. And why is that? So discount usability, and again, I know people will uh, be scared of the word discount, but it is what we do. Uh, discount meaning we should be able to run, a, run 12 to 16 participants in a week's time and hopefully get the findings together in that same week. So discount meaning we want, this, we want to get great actionable data as cheaply and quickly as possible. Um, also, fMRI is very expensive. Um, this goes back to the discount. We don't want to be paying for that. EEG um, is really time consuming and the commodity equipment really isn't there yet uh, for us user experience researchers to use. The emotive headset, which you see there on the right, 
uh, has a lot of potential, but it's really not ready for our world yet. I've used it uh, a lot. Um, it's very interesting. It's very cool. But in terms of pulling off a discount study, uh, it's not quite there yet. Um, and, and this is really the crux of why neural marketing is not helping the, uh, the UX community. Those, those companies typically rely on their special sauce, um, the algorithm by which they interpret the data. Uh, and this is not necessarily shared with the research community. Um, earlier in the presentation, I, I shared with you different papers that have been published in studies uh, that have helped the user experience community. But when looking into neural marketing, in user experience, there's really not much out there. Um, companies that are trying to make money from this um, don't want to publish, and rightfully so. Um, companies do have the right to make uh, money from their intellectual property, but this really inhibits the rest of us from using this in a, a beneficial way in the user experience field. Um, so what do we have to do? We need to do it ourselves. Um, we need to bring psychophysiology to user experience. Uh, and there has been some initial research done here. Uh, the Ward and Mardson um, paper is possibly my most favorite paper I've ever read. And what they've done, what they did, is they built two interfaces, a good and a bad interface. With the bad interface, they specifically broke a lot of Nielsen's rules, uh, heuristic rules, and they measured people's biometric feedback. And they found very uh, succinctly that the bad in in interface caused higher skin conductivity, the GSR, lower blood volume, and increased uh, pulse rate across the board. Um, and similarly, in 2005, Lynn and Hugh did a very similar thing where they had people play uh, a game. Um, and they did three tasks. And the, the tasks were of increasing difficulty, and they found the same exact thing. As the tasks increased in difficulty, uh, the higher skin conductivity, lower blood volume, and so forth. So the signs are there that this is a useful tool, um, but it's not mainstream in any way in our field. And I think that the time has come for us to uh, really bring it to our field. Um, and then and sickle, um, uh, the sickle study, study here, um, we, can, we can see trends over time. Uh, that's also what this allows us to do. Uh, in this study, they found that participants who didn't do well on tasks initially really maintained that high stress level throughout the rest of the study and continued to perform poorly on subsequent tasks. So this allows us to gather data, um, not just on a task-by-task -task basis, but also um, within the, the entire study. Uh, we can look at that trend over all of the times, um, which is very interesting as well. Um, yes, of course, there are caveats to, to doing this. Um, one of the, the tenets of doing usability work is that we want to mimic real-world experience as best we can. Um, so a person sitting at a computer with these various wires protruding from various body parts uh, isn't exactly real-world. And, uh, and part of being a usability moderator is to um, ensure participant comfort. That should be one of the very first things on our mind when a participant walks in the door. So we don't want to cause them any discomfort. Um, so that's, so that's a caveat as well. Uh, and then going back to what I was saying earlier about think aloud versus retrospective think aloud and usability, I, I think it's the same exact thing here. Uh, we don't want to have, I, I don't even think we want the moderator sitting in the room with the participant while collecting biofeedback. Of biometric information, because any other stimulus is going to alter that, and we want the stimulus to be the, the, the what's on screen. Um, so consider the use of think aloud versus retrospective think aloud. Perhaps retrospective think aloud is the way to go uh, for this particular way, similar to eye tracking. And again, we want to minimize cost. Um, Again, this kind of usability testing, we want this to be as uh, cost efficient and time efficient as possible. Um, so that has, to, that has to be kept in mind if we want to bring this to user experience. So how can we do this? I think we need to concentrate the conversation on galvanic skin response, GSR. 
uh, Affectiva. Uh, you can see the, uh, the uh, picture on the right. Um, they have a very promising piece of equipment, the Q-Sensor, which measures uh, GSR wirelessly. Uh, and that's very nice. All of the stuff I've used previously is all bot wired. And again, as I mentioned, you don't want the participants sitting there with wires coming out of their body parts because that's uncomfortable for them. Uh, GSR is also less subject to noise. Um, which is important because we want to try to filter out that noise as best we can. It has a very response uh, time to event-related changes. So what that means is that the, the time it takes for the body to react after, after something happens in the mind is very quick. For some of the other traces, it could be a matter of, excuse me, it could be a matter of seconds, and that's too long. We want it to be milliseconds. And so GSR does provide that. Um, multiple sessions per day with minimal incremental cost. This is very important going back to the discount usability um, theme. Again, we want to we run as many people as possible, uh, but still get good data. Uh, so with a device such as Affectiva's here and using GSR in general, we can do just that. We won't have to um, take 15 minutes in order to put sensors all over people's body or um, align EEG sensors on their head. Um, which is uh, what I've done in the past with the emotive, and that is very time intensive. So that kills the discount usability idea. And overall, uh, the, the, the process is indeed tricky. Uh, the idea is that we want to marry up, again, the, the eye tracking with the GSR to find out what they were looking at when uh, they, they had a change in GSR, be it positive or negative. And that's done very manually right now through spreadsheets and aligning spreadsheets and more tools to really use it. Uh, to, make this, to make this happen. But overall, GSR is really one of the most promising biometric measures of arousal or stress. Uh, there is indeed the problem of valence, and so what that means is did, was the stress or arousal positive or negative? Um, and this can be done, so this can be alleviated possibly by looking at what the user was doing, again, looking at the eye tracking data, was what they were looking at stressful or, or not? Uh, or was it positive stress or not, or negative stress? Um, heart rate variability is also another biometric uh, that has been shown to measure emotional balance, um, but there really isn't that wireless, um, easy-to-use tool quite yet. So that has, that's a possibility for the future. If we could marry up galvanic skin response to heart rate variability, um, GSR gives us the the spike in arousal, be it negative or positive, heart rate variability would give us that balance. That'd be pretty cool. Let take some water. Sure. So, what can we expect from all of this? Why am I? Why? Why are we all listening to this for uh, 45 minutes or so? Why is this important? Again, we want to break through that cognitive bias which is inherent in traditional usability studies, we are relying on what users are telling us. And that's great, what they tell us is important, um, but how many of us have um, sat through a usability study where the participant struggles with a task for minutes on end and then tells us it's easy? That's cognitive bias, we want to make a break through that if we can. Um, we want to get that objective quantitative data that we have been looking for forever. Um, eye tracking was the start of that, and I think marrying up eye tracking with the psychophys data is the way to really bring it home. And we can, we can definitely have a better of our understanding of our participants' feelings, um, which is something that we really can't get at with qualitative. Again, we can, we can ask them night and day how they're feeling, and, and if we can look at that directly, that's going to give us the, the best data. Um, if, if, there's, if it's causing undue negative stress, we should know about it. So in conclusion here, um, I'm not saying that uh, traditional eye tracking is, is not the way to go. I definitely think it's the way to go. Uh, it's the right tool for the right time. Um, and so use traditional eye tracking, but marry it up with the psychophys. That's the next step. It's a very manual process right now through spreadsheets and such. More, more tools are definitely needed, but uh, there's a great opportunity there. Um, scoring that secret sauce, uh, as I mentioned with the neuromarketing companies. Share your techniques and findings. Publish both good and bad. 
um, what's working, what's not working. Get out there and, and publish and tell us what you're doing with this. Um, share it with the UX community, the user experience community. I want to, we want to hear about um, what's working and what's not working for you, and that's the best way to bring this to the user experience community. And this may very well be that quantitative thing we've been looking for, and I do encourage folks to uh, go join up in the psychophysiology and usability group on LinkedIn. Um, I'd love to further this conversation. Uh, the time is right for this to come to the user experience community, and it's a very exciting time. Um, next two slides are just some references, which you can read uh, at your leisure. And with that, I already see the questions starting to come in, so uh, I'm going to start answering them. Okay. So just give me one second. I'm going to read these questions to myself before I read them to you. And just okay. a reminder too, guys, feel free to um, put all of your questions in the chat or Q&A box on the right-hand side so um, Dan can see them. Good point. Thank you, Courtney. Yes, don't be shy with questions. I love questions. So the first one here, uh, I would like to ask if, there's, if there are any potential pitfalls in combining the two methods, eye tracking and GSR data, and if it's possible, possible to measure engagement, quote-unquote engagement, with a website using the combination. Um, I don't see any potential pit, pit, pitfalls. Uh, all data is good data in my mind. Uh, something to keep in mind is that you don't want to forego the qualitative. So I think even, and this goes for eye tracking as well, what you need is a combination of, of methods um, using the different tools. So do a usability study and allocate two or three tasks to be eye tracking tasks where the person doesn't talk aloud, uh, think aloud, that sort of thing. And whether it's possible to measure engagement, that's, that's, that is indeed the term um, that, that, that is most popular these days. Um, I think it comes, I guess it depends, of course, on what engagement really means. But I would say, yes, um, it would be possible to measure engagement, be it, uh, either, be it positive or negative. So if their DSR are showing that they are positively aroused, yeah, we can definitely measure that engagement. Um, and see where that attention is uh, if we marry it up with the eye tracking. Okay, I'm going to read another question here. Okay, yeah. All right, so we never compare physio from people to people uh, precisely because people physiologically differ. We always compare each person to his or her baseline. Um, so shouldn't we be using a between subjects instead, um, between subjects design instead? Uh, yes, uh, the, uh, so the within subjects me um, mention that I had in there was for eye tracking. Um, for psychophys, it's definitely going to be different, um, and you should be comparing the data to uh, a person's baseline. Um, you can't really compare a person's GSR to another person's GSR because people differ, people physiologically, people phys differ physiologically. Um, so you want to be comparing a person's Psycho, uh, a person's bio, biometric signs with their own. So that's a great point. Um, so with psycho, psycho phys, um studies of between subjects is probably the way to go. Great question there. Um, with, uh, can you speak more to the need to over-recruit participants that you mentioned pre previously? Uh, so with any data collection method like this, eye tracking or psycho phys, you're not going to be able to use the data from every participant, um, whether it's they have very light eyes that you couldn't screen for and the eye tracker couldn't handle that, um, or it's very dark eyes, I think, that had its awesome. I forget either. Um, or um, so essentially people slipping through the screener or people not wanting to do the eye tracking. Uh, essentially what it comes down to is that it's inevitable that one or two subjects, you won't be able to use their data. So that's why you have to over-recruit. Okay. Yeah, so this, this next one is a, is a great question. How do you establish a baseline for psychophysiology measures? Do you measure the heart rate, et cetera, before the study and compare, the ra uh, compare to the rates during the study? Uh, and that is the question of the day when it comes to doing this. Um, and that's the question that we as researchers need to come together and figure out what is the best, best methodology 
uh, for doing this sort of thing. Um, what I've done in the past for this sort of thing is exactly as the uh, person uh, questioned here. Yes, so before the actual study, um, have them sit um, unstimulated for a while in order to get that baseline, um, and then you can compare uh, the, the stimulus to the baseline after the fact. And you want to be careful when collecting that baseline. You don't want to be in the room with them because uh, that will affect the readings, but you have to be careful. Um, I've seen participants uh, break out a book all of a sudden and start reading, and while that is certainly going to affect the, uh, the baseline. So you want to be cognizant of that as well. Um, so what other devices can be used to capture GSR? Um, in the past, I've used the ProComp Infinity. Uh, that is one that's fairly standard in the, in the academic research community. But that's also one that is, uh, has wires, and you're going to have wires coming out and hindering people. The GSR sensor that they have on the, on the ProComp, uh, essentially two straps that you put around the, the middle two fingers. And well, if we want to have people using a computer, they're going to want to use those two fingers. Uh, that's why I like the Affectiva one a little better. Is one eye tracker better than the other? Other? Uh, I really couldn't say. Um, I've only used the Toby eye trackers. Uh, I've not used SMI, um, so I don't know offhand. Let's see here. Um, and overall, is eye tracking uh, is eye tracking worth the cost? Well, it depends. Um, as I mentioned, those eye tracking the the, the, the eye tracking tools are quite um, expensive. And is it is it worth the cost? If you work for a larger company that can afford to have this tool, then yes, I think it's definitely worth the cost. Again, it gets back to the getting past the cognitive bias, finding out what people are looking at. Um, and it, it, again, it also looks. It also depends on the questions that you're looking to have answered. Of course, um, can you do something? And, and, and uh, as with usability, it's good to do this iteratively. So if you have an eye tracker in your office and you can bring in a few participants while you're iterating on a design, that's great because you can inform your design with the quantitative and qualitative um, while you're doing the process. So. Overall, I would say yes, it's worth it. It's worth the cost. Uh, all right. So, are there any other questions out there um, regarding the methodology, uh, why this is important, what the heck psychophys is? Uh, let me know if you have any other questions. And again, I would uh, encourage folks, and I'll go back to that slide uh, at the bottom here, to join the psychophysiology and usability group on LinkedIn. Uh, when I, can, I would love to continue this conversation. Uh, and I uh, would also love to um, talk to you directly. So um, my email address is dberlin at madpow.net, uh, and my Twitter handle is at banderlin. Um, and we have another question. Can you track eye movement on a device with both on-screen and physical controls? Uh, that is, for that situation, you're going to want a head-mounted uh, eye tracker. Because with a with a one uh, with a remote eye tracker, the one where the in, the eye, the sensors are in the monitor, you're not going to capture physical controls. So you want to have a head mounted one using the glasses um, that I showed earlier. That way, you'll capture both on screen and the physical controls. Um, so I'll get back to my contact information there at the bottom. Um, so please don't be shy with saying hello and continuing the conversation. Um, and I really do appreciate everyone taking the time to listen in. This is a very exciting time for user experience research, and it's really up to us to take the next step. So thank you, everyone. I really do appreciate your time. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, we will have the recording and the slides available on MadPow's site in about a day or so. Um, feel well, look out for... Um, the link, we'll be tweeting it. Uh, we'll also have it on Facebook, and we'll send everyone an email who attended today, and you guys can get it directly to your inbox. Uh, definitely stay tuned for upcoming webinars. Uh, great job today, Dan. Um, this, is, this is a pretty amazing subject, and uh, I look forward to looking into future conversations. Thanks, guys. <laughs>